You may be seated. We're going to dive into Romans chapter 9, or uh, I wasn't here last week, but obviously reading the chapter and even listening to Ben's sermon, I know we could call chapter 9, for better or worse, predestination part 2, the sequel. Uh, so let's talk about movies and their sequels for a minute, just to, just to help us dive in. Uh, the first Terminator movie. Anybody put a date to that? 1984? It's actually a masterful bit of storytelling that involves time travel. Anybody love time travel stories back to the, from Back to the Future? You've got comedy, you've got serious ones. In this one, two guys come back in time to our present. Well, the 80s, right? <laughs> one is a robot. Just bear with me if you've never seen it. It actually, the premise is simple. So even if you haven't seen the film, a robot is sent back in time by an artificial intelligence that's determined to alter the past by killing a woman who is about to give birth to someone that will defeat it in the future. But a second person comes back. A human man is sent back to protect that woman in question. What happens then is that human male subsequently falls in love with her and fathers the child that will actually be the leader that destroys the artificial intelligence. So consider what the artificial intelligence does to prevent its destruction actually provokes and leads to its destruction. If it hadn't sent back the robot, the child's father wouldn't have been sent back to counter it. And so the baby would never have been born. Now, so you can call that causality, or you can call that fate, but it's a perfect loop that closes on itself. The ends are determined ultimately then. What is done to stop or alter the future is the very thing that brings about the existing future. Another scholar, a Master Uguay, once said, one often meets his destiny on the road he takes to avoid it. Right? The same could be said of Jonah, for instance, in the Bible. The problem was, along came a movie called Terminator 2. <laughs> and now the story is changed up a bit. Because young, the young man, John Connor, is now born. He's the predicted hero of the future. But instead of just training him to be the one who saves the world from that evil artificial intelligence in the future, his mother, with John and a reprogrammed Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? they decide to try to stop the war before it ever begins. They want to change the future. And of course, the premise goes on. They change the future. So the movie's mission and the message are wrapped around one axiom. The future is not set. There's no fate but what we make for ourselves. Right? Merca. I mean, like, that's, that's right there. That's... Rugged American individualism at its best. The future is not set. There's no fate what we make, but what we make for ourselves. Now you're like, why are we talking about two different Terminator movies with messages? Because what we're actually seeing between Terminator 1, a closed loop where the events that try to alter a, a fate actually cause it. It's a very Macbeth kind of element there. But what we're actually seeing between Terminator 1 and Terminator 2 is an ancient debate between Stoics and Epicureans. And as you don't need a history lesson this morning, but the Stoics believed the human decisions and actions ultimately went according to a divine plan devised by some kind of deity, and that their souls and circumstances under which they lived were all part of a universal network of fate. The Epicureans challenged those beliefs, denying the existence of divine fate entirely. They believed that human, humans' actions were voluntary. So this isn't sci-fi, we're actually talking about this is actually about three centuries before Jesus Christ even came into the world. This debate's been going a little on a little longer than before the 80s. Traditional usage actually defines fate as a power or agency that predetermines and orders the course of events. Fate or, is then considered inevitable or unavoidable. Right? The idea has been personified in religions outside of Christianity. Classical and European mythology even personify fate spinners. The Moira in Greek, Parse in Roman, Norns in Norse mythology, it's all over the place. Fate's about, fate and destiny are ideas that have been 
a part of the conversation for the generations of men. And what's funny is, if we're honest with ourselves, we like to play fast and loose with the idea of destiny because sometimes we love the idea of destiny, don't we? Right? It's romantic in some times, right? Sometimes we love it. We like to think that you know, the person we married was our density or our destiny. We love the idea of destiny when it means some fated outcome that benefits us. And then all of a sudden when, when we start to think, but wait a minute, what if it potentially impinges on my desires? No way, I don't believe in fate or destiny. The reality is we can't have it both ways. Fate and destiny have been around conceptually forever in the human, and they still are. And that doesn't mean we go all the way to fatalism or determinism. But when Paul's writing to the Romans, we need to understand they're in a culture with Epicureans and Stoics and this debate raging. They didn't need Terminator movies. They didn't need rugged American individualism. All of this was around. And it's in that context Paul's writing. And the Bible has something definite to say about it, which we're going to talk about today, and everybody's still arguing about it. And what have we been, what have we been covering so far? We've been talking about God's wrath. In Romans chapter 1 and 2, none are righteous. We even said that in our, in our catechism today. No, not one. We have no excuse. In the old video, we talked about because of Adam, we inherited sin. None are righteous. We have no excuse. The law doesn't save. Only grace and only that. How do we get grace? Only by salvation, by faith in Christ alone. Amen? Amen. Amen. And Paul's been saying, I cannot obey the law. Its very existence condemns me. Now that sounds like almost in terms of being fated, doesn't it? What of my destiny then? Apart from divine intervention, it seems I am destined for hell. So the question is then, what does it mean to get salvation by faith in Christ alone? And this sermon starts kind of like a downer, but let's remember just last week, chapter 8 had huge encouragements for us who weren't here. Right? Paul says, yeah, in Christ there's no condemnation. There's this amazing encouragement. There's no condemnation in Jesus. And he says in verse 37 in chapter 8, No, in all these things we are, more, we are conquerors through him who loved us. That's empowering speech. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor robots sent back from the future, right? Nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. But in that, we get eternal life forever with God, co-heirs with Christ incarnate. Plus, he then emphasizes in chapter, we also get help now in our times of weakness. It's not just future help, it's now help. And everlasting love. And so some of us might then think, so, okay, so I need salvation by faith. So by God's grace, i got to have faith. So I gotta summon that faith, I gotta will it up, I gotta hold on to it, I gotta, I gotta make my mind believe and make my mind trust. And then I hit Ephesians and it says, by grace you've been saved through faith and it's not from you. It's the gift of God. Oh, so I'm, I have salvation by faith, so I just gotta, oh wait, the, the faith was a gift? That's why in that chapter eight, in verse 29, it says for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom God predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. That's the staggering way we find ourselves in as we move into chapter 9. And so Paul begins in light of that statement in verse 1. If you got your Bibles open, you can follow along also throw it up on the screen. Paul says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. My kinsmen, according to the flesh, they're Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. To them belong the patriarchs. And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all. Blessed forever. Amen. But it's not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not all who are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring, but... Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. 
This means that it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. But this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For if the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth, so then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews also, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully, and without delay, and as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is, righteousness that is by faith, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law? Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They've stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. God's people said, Amen. Amen. I don't want us to miss Paul's honesty here before we get into theology. As the theology in Romans chapter 9 can be very heavy and very heady, but let's not forget Paul's attitude at the beginning. He says, This is the way it is. And then he says, this is the way God says it is. And honestly, it's breaking my heart. Right? We can't lose that sometimes when we have a firm and solid theology and we think about God's wrath and it being meted out on those who deserve it like Pharaoh. Like this, we see in Paul here a lament for those who are accursed. In fact, we see... We see a more powerful faith and almost an inherent offer in what he's talking about. Here's a test of faith. Who among us, myself included, would say, if you'd save these other people, cut me off and make me accursed for the sake of them. Save them and send me to hell. I'm not sure my faith is as strong as Paul's. Right? Right? I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. I see, Paul was the Jew of Jews, right? He was, he was the guy who was, if anybody was doing close to everything right, it was Paul. And he thought, well, that's how you get to salvation. And these Christians preaching this false gospel and saying Jesus is the way, they need to be you know, beat up or killed. Like, but he had a stark realization. And here we see part of that lament, even though he's fully on team Christian at this point. He's like, it, my heart still breaks 
And Paul's realization is that the people of the prophecy, the people of God's promise, as he understood it, aren't who they thought he would. That they, he thought they were some, it was going to be a different way. He thought it was a different... It's a good question for some of us. When we think about the gospel, when we think about the people of promise... So especially if we were raised in the church to you know, be good people and sort of follow some Bible rules and then, then God lets you into heaven. Is that the gospel? And, and are God's people really who we think they are? And we can relate to this. I think our challenge today, if there's a few challenges for us to mull and consider and, and sort of chafe at a little bit in this passage, chapter 9, our first one maybe is that the way we think it works is not necessarily how God is working. Right? Part of growing in Christ means our, our theology, our understanding of God is always maturing. Not outside of the boundaries of the Bible, but by the Bible slowly shaped and all of the wrong thinking carved and shaped it and sort of chiseled away. Right? Paul is actually sad. Israel and the Jews are not, by nature of being biological Jews, being saved. Bloodlines and their rituals and their sacrifices. Affiliation doesn't save. Right? And he quotes Hosea. He's looking back at the prophets. He's like, oh, I get it now. Those who are not my people, I will call my people. He's folding in the Gentiles. All the non-Jews are becoming Christians and getting saved. And we can relate. It's not always the quote-unquote alleged professing card-carrying Christian. A lot of people can say, I'm a Christian. A lot of people can wave the flag. But you know what? The way we think it works is not necessarily how God is working. It's a believer in Jesus. What does he make clear here? That has a regenerated heart by the will and action of our creator and our author and our perfecter, God. The way we think it works is not necessarily how God is working. Remember a few weeks ago, a few chapters ago, I actually found a slide. I, I don't make all of these myself. Sometimes there's some great work that's already out there as you fish around and look at commentaries and different things. You find some good things to be just used. Just grab a slide. Hey, this really explains it better than I could. I'll put it up here. It's simple and succinct. And it was that corollary a few weeks ago between Adam and Jesus. And it's, it's a, you know, in one man, everything fell. And now in another man, and then through Jesus, there's a new covenant. There you go. Adam had authority over all creation, tempted and failed. Jesus tempted and passed. Adam caused all mankind to be infected with sin, and Jesus causes all in him to be healed from sin and death. Here's something I didn't show you. I won't say I didn't show you in a second. I changed the slide. Not, I mean, not on my own will, based on a lot of other commentary. I think there's, you know, this slide is good, but it's not quite there yet. The person who whipped it up doesn't quite go along with not just James's theology, but, but 2,000 years of theological work done by great men from Augustine in 300, the Reformers in 1500, etc., etc. Let's take a look at the original slide. Cause, Adam caused all mankind to be infected with sin, right there in the middle. Jesus gave all mankind opportunity to be forgiven of sin. I, do you guys feel a little bit of difference there? Adam's actions had definite imposed impact. We talked about it in previous chapters. I've inherited sin. I'm born with a sin nature. I am wired, as our catechism uh, speaker talked about in that video, I'm wired wrong. I need somebody to rewire me. Through Adam, I've inherited things. I'm under the curse of original sin and inherited sin. Jesus just made something else possible, maybe? Maybe? Nothing definite? No imposed impact? How come Adam got to impose an impact, but Jesus doesn't impose anything? Another way, another way this happens sometimes is somebody might say, opened a window of possibility of saving from sin. That, that's a view that, that you'll find in some churches sometimes. And so then sometimes it's like, well, that doesn't really correspond well with Adam, so maybe we need to change Adam a little bit. Let's Let's maybe water down Adam, too, and just say, Adam opened a window of temptation for all mankind. Well, now, because, because Adam sinned, and now I have a temptation proclivity to maybe sin. God, that's not the language of Scripture. 
No, none are righteous. None seek without the stirring of the Holy Spirit, without a regenerated heart. I am seeking nothing but death and damnation. I've cursed because of what happened through the fall. And I need somebody to rewire and undo that. These ways of saying it elevate human choice and elevate human will. And that's the struggle is, is, is it really biblical? Causes is strong. Causes is a strong term. Jesus causes all in him to be healed from sin and death. That's so why in chapter 8 we hit those tough verses, right? For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. There's our destiny and fate to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. Again, the way we think it works is not necessarily how God is working. And I always need to be seeking. That's maybe our second lesson that we can learn today is I need to be always be looking to submit to Scripture's revealing description of God and not, not my assumptions of will, not James' assumptions of fairness. Paul was a Jew so certain he knew how God worked that he was persecuting other Christians for it, having people killed. And now God is schooling him by the Holy Spirit, shaping and rehoning the way that he thinks. Even when some of it he looks at, he's like, this is happening. It actually gives me sorrow, but, but I submit to God and his will. Because it's not as if the word of God has failed. Paul sees Israel going astray. It's like, was, is God's word failing? No, God's achieving exactly what he destined to do. You're not part of the kingdom because you're a Jew. It's not because of works. It's not because of will. And so he goes on. He really punctuates it here with an Old Testament story. It says, And Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born. Two kids hadn't been born yet. Neither had done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. Jacob I loved. Esau I hated. Right? This is where we get to the finger-clenching, white-knuckling conversation of God's sovereign choice. I went to Ording High School just down in the Rainier Valley, and I would actually get into it. I really didn't. I liked to argue. I actually didn't really care that much about Jesus when I was 17, 18, but I was in speech and debate class. And I would have, I would have you know, outside of school debates with my Baptist friends. Because they would talk about things like predestination and election. And that's not how I was raised. So I, I really didn't, I liked winning arguments. So I won't even like, I was a holy Christian like Paul arguing for the way I thought it was. No, I just like to turn things around on people and kind of be a jerk sometimes. And so I, I didn't really want to consider their view. I just practiced and worked all the arguments I knew to write off and dismiss the view. But something stuck in my head with those conversations with my buddy Andrew, my buddy Mark, back in 1990. Several somethings stuck in my head. They kept using the word election. They kept using the word predestination. And in 16, 17 years of being raised in church, those words were never used. It's like, wait, they're in my Bible. I've always skimmed past them and sort of glossed over them. It sounds flowery. It sounds like some Shakespearean prose I'll just sort of explain away. I took all the power out of the words in favor of human reason and the way that I autonomically interpreted all the other passages that I did like. And at some point then, about seven years later, it's like, you know, what if I studied them and gave them the weight that they had and then looked back at all the surrounding verses and interpreted them in light of those? And what, what you begin to find as Paul is, is re-enunciating over and over again in chapters 8 and 9 is that the word chosen is all over your scripture. Early, Deuteronomy 7, 6 says, You are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be his people and a treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. In Psalms, the psalmist says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Jump into the New Testament then. Peter, not Paul, the first Peter says, You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a people for his own possession. Of course, we see in verse 11, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Now, Jesus himself kind of goes one step heavier in John chapter 6, which is a, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. 
One, because it's rich in God's promise, but also then chafing at my own normal human heart. In John 6, he goes, Jesus says, This is why I told you, no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. In verse 60 in chapter 6, the disciples heard it, heard it, and they say, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing his disciples were grumbling, said, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. So I was raised with this. I was raised with an understanding. It's like, well, sure, in the Old Testament, God, uh, he, they were all chosen. But now we're, we're under the New Testament covenant, and now it's about choosing. So I'm not chosen? Is that in my scripture? See, I don't want to do a Greek lesson, but the word actually translated predestined in our scriptures means determining beforehand, ordaining, deciding ahead of time. What did God determine ahead of time? According to Romans 8, he determined certain individuals to be conformed to the likeness of his son, called, justified, and glorified. God predetermining individuals to be saved. Numerous scriptures, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Romans 8, Ephesians 1, 11. There's a whole list of them. Predestination is the biblical doctrine that God in his sovereignty chooses individuals to be saved. And the most common objection to this, of course, is that it's unfair. Why would God choose certain individuals and not others? Well, the important thing to remember, like we ask a statement, it's like, well, let me step back and ask about the statement that's under that statement. The important thing to remember is whether or not anyone deserves to be saved. Now, before service, I actually uh, handed out a few things. Did anybody get a dollar bill this morning? You guys who? All right. I don't know. There's a few people. Yeah. A few people got a dollar bill from the pastor before service. <laughs> now, before we ask any, before I ask somebody, my wife, and you know, what was their first question? Why? And what did I tell them? Nothing. Wait and see. All right, before we ask the question, why did they get dollar bills, let's ask some other questions first. Who walked in here today deserving a dollar bill from Pastor James? <laughs> well, that's a long story. We don't have time to get into that one. <laughs> I know he deserved a good dollar bill from Pastor James. If James gave out a few dollar bills, I mean, I guess you could swell. That's unfair. You gave five people a dollar. That means everybody should have gotten a dollar. Does anybody have a right to be upset they didn't get a dollar? Right, you get, no one deserves anything from God. In fact, that's even putting it mildly. We actually do deserve something from God. He makes that quite clear. In our sin, we deserve not just nothing. We deserve eternal punishment. No one can object if he receives nothing. No one can reject if they get what they deserve, whether that's nothing, whether that's something. A man randomly handing out money to five people in a crowd. The man didn't owe anyone money, so if he handed out some money to the people in the crowd, if he decided to be gracious to some, theoretically you could say it's unfair, but then Paul kind of sees that coming, doesn't he? He says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? And then he uses that phrase we've been using the last several weeks, by no means. He goes back to Moses. I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. And if I take somebody like Pharaoh, as he talks about in verse 17 and 18, if I decide to harden Pharaoh's heart so that I can crush him as an example to those I'm saving, that's my sovereign choice. Therefore, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Right? All my high school debate skills went out the window on that verse. And part of me is just like, you know what, we, we, I'm gonna, we waste too much time on this free will debate. Doesn't matter. Paul's not unclear here. I had these counter arguments, and Paul anticipated my counter arguments and put them in chapter 9. Like, you will say to me then, why does God still find fault? Nobody can resist his will. Why does he still find fault? And then we get the answer that everyone loves 
from the history of all mankind for all time, and I'm kidding, we get, who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? I want us to consider, maybe for some of us, as we even think about sharing the gospel or talking to others about Jesus, do we try to, do we waste time making up ways where we try to excuse God's firmness here? There's actually a wealth of books that try to explain this away. Sort of fandango around this firm, God-given emphasis here. Because people will ask, well, if God is love and just and all of those things, why is there suffering in the world? Job asked a similar question. And God said a variation. At the end of the book of Job, he says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Oh, that's right. You didn't even exist yet. I don't like that humbling answer, but sometimes God just gives that humbling answer. Verse 22 says, What if God, desiring to show his wrath, make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he's prepared beforehand for glory? Vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. That's not fair. Why does God do it that way? I deserve an answer. Oh, wait, no, I don't. I won't vote. And some people are right there. We encounter people sometimes in culture. Why does God do it that way? I deserve an answer, and I won't believe in him unless I like your answer. Like the answer is, here's an even better way. I would say it in talking with somebody else, because you know, who are you points a finger one direction. The question is, who are we? Who are we? Well, what is molded say to the molder, why, you've made, why have you made me like this? Is the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Does God have the right to say, here's one vessel, honorable use. Here's another one. Right, the tough part there is when you're talking to people, they might misunderstand that. They might say, oh, Oh, so I'm the dishonorable use person. You're also honorable and stuff. I'm refuse and you're God's special little snowflake. And my answer to that would be, I, do, I don't know the end of your story yet, man. Maybe you'll wait, maybe if I'm talking to somebody who doesn't know Jesus, here's my answer. Who are we? I don't know why he has, made, he has enabled my heart to see, believe, confess, repent, but I, your story's not over yet. Maybe you'll wake up tomorrow and get on your knees and confess your sin and become a more amazing Christian than I ever have been or ever will be this side of heaven. Maybe you'll trump me in every way imaginable. Maybe you'll look more like Paul or Peter, whereas I'm down here like a, I don't know, doubting Thomas? I don't know. My status isn't because of my brains. My status isn't because of my heart or my will or my exertion. It's simply the grace of God that I can't fully explain. And I have to rest that that's just sufficient for me. And I pray that his spirit will make it sufficient for you. And who are we? Paul then even goes on to explain, this will be a tripping hazard for everybody. Right? Jews, Gentiles. He puts it here in the point, like the Jews have stumbled over this because I've told them it's not your works, it's not your will, it's not your exertion. I'm folding Gentiles in because it's about my grace and my unmerited favor. And all the Jews at that point, like so, well, a lot of the original Christians were Jews, by the way, but a huge chunk, obviously, that didn't accept Jesus, were just tripping over that. Like, no, I don't, that's not fair. That doesn't make sense. I'm descended from Abraham. I've done my sacrifices. I've exerted my will. I've done all of these things. Like, this is going to be the tripping hazard, and people are going to read this passage and declare God to be unfair and unjust. Like, no, no, if, if God's saving those people over there, he owes me a chance. No, he doesn't owe me a chance. He doesn't owe me anything. If God's saving those people over there, he owes us all an evening. He owes us all hell. What's really strange is that he's grabbing a portion and pulling them out and changing their hearts and letting them become his instruments of mercy and grace and fit for heaven. All those O oh things, all those fair things, they have to go. Now, in human affairs, we're called to love one another. We're called to actually be, we're, we are called to exist in a state of loving care and equity. 
Just because God has some sovereign choice doesn't mean James gets us to decide, well, I'm going to be like Jesus. Jesus is God, so I'm going to exert my sovereign choice over Ben. It's like, no, I don't get to impinge on somebody else's will. This whole idea of have, making sure that our wills are as free as possible seems like a good governing space for human-to-human -human affairs than the boundaries of civil law. Right, figuring out that balance seems important. There are places where God is inscrutable and unfathomable in ways that we just have to bend to him on. And that's where it goes back to John 6, like I was talking about. I'll close with this. Jesus, knowing his disciples were grumbling, said to them, do you take offense at this? I took offense at this for like the first 25 years of my life. But he tells his disciples in John chapter 6, the words I speak are spirit and life. This is why I told you no one can come to me unless it's granted him by the Father. Right? It's not be a good person and God will let you into heaven. That's not the gospel. It's not pray this prayer and you'll get salvation. That's not the gospel. It's not summon up some belief by your own amazing human will and then hang on to it and then God will reward you with heaven. That's not the gospel either. Fully embracing the humility of being chosen is important. I believe chosen makes me wholly reliant. God, I'm humbled before you. I don't understand even fully why you would choose me, why you would rip scales off my eyes and let me see truth. Chosen makes me wholly reliant. You chose me for some inexplicable reason as a demonstration of your mercy. Thank you. Chosen also then makes me no better than others. I don't get to look out and say, if somebody comes to me and says, oh, James, you, you think you're better because you're a Christian. No. Better off, but not better. Like, oh, you think you have a good heart and I have a wicked heart. No, I have a new heart. I didn't even earn it. Mine was just as wicked or more than yours. I, I chosen keeps me perfectly balanced between humility and confidence because we see in Paul a great confidence in the gospel and preaching it and being sure of the God that he knows and has been loved by. But there is still an extreme humility. I don't get to look out and say I was smarter than my non-Christian neighbor and I ended up and chose Jesus. I don't get to say I was kinder than my, my non-Christian neighbor. I, I was softer hearted or more naturally inclined toward the one true God. I also don't have to apologize for the gospel to a culture that says truth or good or God is something other. I can have extreme confidence and boldness. Because God's mercy, as Paul is making clear here, does not need to fit everybody's definition of fair. I don't have to prove it's fair by culture or another person's rules of fairness. Scripture alone. I don't have to prove that God is loving by their definition of love. And the answer I have to confront is, like, who am I? I have to submit to Scripture's definition. Who are you? Who are we? Honestly, we all know the truth about us, and a lot of these things we're suppressing. That's why the first Terminator movie was really on to something. By trying to fight a future outcome only brought it to pass. The artificial intelligence actually just did things that created its own end. Then a, a very non-Christian element kicked in. That Epicurean mindset kicked in for Terminator 2. Their future is not set. Folks, that, that's not what our scripture tells us in Revelation and multiple other places throughout the Old and New Testament. Nobody, nobody liked the third Terminator movie except me. <laughs> and I'm not saying it was a great movie. One reason is because it wasn't as big, as impressive, as they had a different director and all these things. But I want to read from a critic. His name is Matt Goldberg. He actually explains why he doesn't like it, and it's because the movie shifts. The character of John Connor's grown a little bit older, and he's beginning to realize there is no fate. Oh, wait, I wish I could believe that, but our destiny was never to stop Judgment Day, merely to survive it. Critic Matt Goldberg says, if the Terminator is the hard-edged action movie of the 80s, and Terminator 2 is the blockbuster of the 90s, Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines is the forgettable film of the 2000s. The conclusion is hope of Terminator 2 was hopeful because it claims the future isn't set and we can avoid judgment, which is a compelling story. Terminator 3 describes all of that, along with pretty much everything else that made the first two movies special. 
obliterating the ending of T2, the message of hope no longer exists. It's a damning moment when the robot tells John that Judgment Day is inevitable. Friends, according to my Bible, Judgment Day is inevitable. It's as real as the reality of grace that I get to preach every Sunday. It's not that God isn't a God of judgment, he's a God of grace. Actually, he is giving grace, and he is also bringing a day of judgment. A determinism would say I'm just a product of causality. Fatalism would say nothing I do matters, it's all predetermined. Scripture would then, as we see Paul working here to explain it, so it could go on to continue in the next chapter as well. He would tell us, yes, God has predestined. Yes, we have a destiny. Yes, it is inevitable. But that doesn't mean we're fatalistic. And then our, human's brain, our human brains hurt a little bit. Because this is where Christians love to, you know, Christians love to stoke this conversation. Well, okay, if it's all predetermined, then why do anything? The fatalist, that's how they feel, right? But that's the power of the gospel. I'm, God frees and changes my heart and inclinations. He changes what would have been my destiny apart from his grace to a destiny that now has changed heart and inclinations. And now I'm free to be the means to his predetermined ends. That's, that's hard to get our grasp, grasp our brains and get, get centered on. A God outside of time and space, as we understand it, sent his son into time and space to bring about a glorious future that off offers escape for all in Christ. We're all products in a causal chain until God by his spirit breathes new life into our dead caused frames. And then hearts can and do birth new inclinations. And then we view our lives differently. Yes, the future's written. And someone would say to me, James, if we're predestined and only God can regenerate the heart, then why try to persuade anybody? Why preach? Well, we'll get into this more next week when Paul himself explains about the need for preaching the good news, even though he's just told us this. Yes, the future is written, but it is not fatalistic. I don't get to say, well, I guess I don't need to evangelize because I guess if they're going to heaven, it's all predetermined. Oh, I guess there's a stranger on the side of the road all beat up. I guess if he's going to survive, he'll survive. If it's predetermined, I don't have to help him. Right? The Good Samaritan didn't believe. The Good Samaritan, in the story of Jesus, describing a, a person of that time, he wouldn't have believed there was no fate but what he made for himself, but he still would have helped the person on the side of the road. Because he would have believed Ephesians 2.8 that says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen? Amen. There's a monologue from William Shakespeare's pastoral comedy, as you like it. Since all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have exits in their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts. He didn't invent this. It turns up in a lot of different places earlier, all the way back even in some spaces, those Epicureans and Stoics back even before Jesus came into the world. The fact that there is a beginning and end to this universe, and that it is written like a play, it does not mean playing my part is not worth nothing. It's not worthless. We're told we are on a stage, God's stage, where every man and woman must play a part. I pray we'll take that stage and play our parts with gladness. To those, to those of you still chafing, this is one of those things where even Peter says, Paul's hard to understand. In, in Scripture, we have one apostle saying, yeah, I get it. This, guy, this guy's hard to, hard to hear, hard to understand. My challenge to you would just be, if you chafe at this, it's okay. We see at the beginning of the chapter, Paul's chafing, right? He's like, I lament, I wish I could just, I wish I could have myself damned to have what's happening be different. Paul's chafing and confused because, but ultimately he bends to God's will. So I'd say if you're still chafing, that's okay. Just don't hate the idea. Right? Paul says, what if? Are you still going to bend your knee? What if it works this way? Are you still going to call God God? Just don't hate it and don't deny it. Because if I start to say, well, if God works this way, it's not fair, it's unjust. Scripture just told me otherwise. 
Whether, whether it's working out in a way that I still think is unfathomable, some people would say, oh, somewhere in the muddy middle of human will and all that. Well, that's fine. But if it's all the way over to the sovereign choice side, just don't hate it and don't deny it. What if? If that's the way God works, I will bend my knee to it. Part of me may think it's, it's got some other pieces involved that are more complex between human will and God's sovereignty. Okay, but, but be careful. Because if you say it definitely doesn't work the way that Paul asks, what if? Might be something going on in our hearts. The chapter has a stern admonition for us and warns some of these facets can be stumbling blocks for our faith. Stumbling blocks by which some, he's warning, have missed the whole gospel. My prayer is that everyone who professes is truly one of God's chosen. And maybe this is the day some of you guys go from lip service to life eternal. Wouldn't that be a wonderful destiny from cognitive ascent with conditions? And some of us, I think, probably are still there. Probably myself in some ways where I need to be humble and repent. We have a cognitive ascent, but there's a couple places where we still haven't bent our knee to God's full truth. Wouldn't it be wonderful if just today our knee bent a little bit more? Maybe for some of us it bent for the first time. i close your eyes and I'll just ask you this. Consider in your mind someone you've been praying for. Because maybe we've been praying in an impotent kind of way. I don't, I don't know your prayer lives and I don't know your hearts, but as you have your eyes closed, closed and you think about someone you know that does not know the good news of Jesus. My fear is that some of us could be praying in a weak way and we could pray stronger and maybe God wants to have our hearts grow in him and that's the day he will, has planned to answer that prayer. Maybe instead of praying, God, I wish you could maybe help them see that they could be better if they gave their life to you. What if we fully gave ourselves over to the idea of sovereign God and began to pray, God, break through. God, break through to their lives. I ask you, do it now. Break through like Paul on the road, like, like Saul on the road to Damascus. Grab this person that I desperately want to be in your kingdom and just hurl them metaphorically to the ground, rip their eye scales off, let them see, invade their heart, pull it out and jam a new functioning one in there. Maybe it's the day where we revel in the regenerative power of the Holy Spirit and we say, God, make it happen. I know they will never do it apart from you. Invade their life, overwhelm them, make yourself irresistible where they just have to, I have no power to say no left here. I am 100% yours. It could be God's growing our hearts as his people first to cry out like children, fully reliant on his sovereignty, fully planning to answer some of our amazing and bold, confident prayers that he will work in people's hearts, that he will change situations, that he will bring healing, both spiritual and physical. I pray today will be another day where we yield more deeply to the concept of his sovereignty and pray more boldly, and more adamantly, and with more passion like we see in Paul. Not a cold resignation to predestination, but a bold and confident prayer and preaching life, loving and serving and proclaiming because we understand that destiny in the romantic and amazing way that God meant it to be. God's people said, Amen. Amen.